Welcome and thank you for joining us at Western Park Baptist Church on this second Sunday of Advent. The Advent season within the church calendar is a time of celebration and reflection of the great love of God for us poor sinners in which, according to Pastor Alan, God broke into our world in solidarity through the baby Jesus. It is also a time of hope, the great hope that God has promised that on a day he has predetermined, he will finally rid the world of sin and evil. An eternal kingdom in which Jesus Christ is king forever and reigns with those who are redeemed by his blood. What a great hope. So as Alan continues the theme of waiting in hope from Mark chapter 1 verses 1 to 8, may we allow our hearts to receive the message of hope that was first shared by John the Baptist to hearts that sought him in the wilderness. Let this be an Advent season, regardless of the ongoing pandemic, a time of hope and trust in the amazing power and providence of God. In this, we have the greatest helper, the Holy Spirit, who is with us even now. Let us pray. Father, thank you for loving us with such great love that we can experience now and through all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, even through this pandemic. We praise and worship your holy name. Father, this morning I ask that you will touch our hearts and that we'll continue to find hope and trust in you, in your love for us and in your great providential care. Thank you for all who are watching today, Lord, I pray that you will touch them wherever they may be through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
only child Jesus is the undefiled Jesus is the Christmas child Born to set us free And we worship Christ the only child And we worship Jesus the undefiled And we worship Christ the Christmas child Born to set us free This is Florida and Curtis checking in, giving you the quarantine edition of the service, if you want to call it that. Uh, we're at a time now where we have to stay distant from everybody, but this is what technology does for you. Still keep in touch in this uh, type of uh, way. So it's good what we're doing. Uh, Mom just celebrated a birthday the other day, which well, is a couple of months ago. Um, she's now 83 years of age. Say thank you, Mom. <laughs> you see? Um, so bless her, she's still going. So I'm doing what I can to um, keep her safe. And uh, I'm also thankful for what I have. I still have my job. A lot of people are losing their jobs as well too. So uh, keep, keep, you know, keep the faith. Um, so just checking in, saying hi. Hope you're all okay. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. And now let's pray for our community. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, again, we come to you as a community. We give you thanks once again for the work that you are doing in our lives as a group, as a church, as a people, as Canadians, as Torontonians, as uh, your children all over the world. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to see your glory, even in our needs, whatever they may be and that we may be able to declare great hope that you reign in all our circumstances. Father, I ask for healing for a battered world right now. I ask, Lord, that you will intervene and release us, O oh God, into a better circumstance than we have right now. I pray for those who are working in our various hospitals, our doctors, our nurses. I pray for leaders in our communities, Lord, that you would grant them wisdom and knowledge to take the right decisions regarding how to move forward and get through this pandemic. Encourage our hearts, O oh Lord, in, through this Advent season 
and cause us, O oh Lord, to praise your name, no matter our circumstance. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Look, I am sending my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The whole region of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He preached, saying, After me is coming one mightier than I, the straps of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Welcome uh, to Weston Park Baptist Church, the second Sunday of Advent. Uh, last week we began with a text from Mark 13, uh, which invited us to be awake, uh, to be alert to the coming of Christ. Of course, the incarnation Advent is about the coming of Jesus. So we want to be awake and alert to that. That's where we began. Today we look at a second text, which is also from the lectionary, uh, for the second week of Advent, and it has to do with preparing the way for the Lord. And so, again, we are to keep awake, and we are to be sensitive to the Lord's coming and what that might mean for us. As you know, as you read the Gospels, uh, the Gospel of Mark does not include any nativity chronicles. It jumps right into the adult ministry of Jesus. And it begins with the uh, story of John the Baptist. So here we are, Mark chapter 1, preparing the way, and we hear uh, the words of Mark in this point. So the evangelist writes for us, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so that's how the Gospel of Mark begins. And as we look at this unit, we can see that it moves from the past to the present to the future. So the past, meaning uh, the story of Mark being rooted in the Old Testament um, history. And so that's where we begin. So we have this opening statement in verse 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's really an opening title. And so it has the statement, the beginning of the good news. So it has allusions back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, where it begins in the beginning. Here Mark writes the beginning of the good news. So beginning has shades of the Old Testament, the Genesis story. The good news is the word, the gospel. Mark is presenting the good news, the gospel, and it refers to Jesus. And indeed, we have three titles there. We have Jesus, which means Savior, or God saves. Christ is Messiah, the anointed one. And then a reference to the Son of God, or a favorite title that is used by Mark is the Son of Man. So Jesus, Christ, Son of God. This is how uh, Mark begins. That's his title for the entire book. So not a story of the infancy of Christ, but launches right into the good news of the gospel, which Mark sees as very good news. And he wants us to uh, be aware of that as he begins. And then he cites 
a fusion of a text from both Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi was the last prophet who had spoken to Israel 400 years before the time of John. So he be, picks up, Mark, a text from Malachi, and then also a statement from Isaiah. And indeed, it is Isaiah that's credited. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, verse 2, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. That's Malachi. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's Isaiah 40. And so Mark begins the good news, and then he goes back and looks at the Old Testament story. He announces this text before the Christ comes. And this was a, a, a pattern both in the Old Testament story and in the days of, of uh, Jesus, the days of the Roman Empire where before a king would come, there would be an announcement. So someone would go ahead of the king, announce the way, so that people are prepared that the king is coming or the emperor is coming, so be it. And so Mark is using that idea as he begins, launches back into the Old Testament, someone comes and announces that the king is coming, and then he's going to go on and then ultimately talk about Jesus. So it is a message of promise and fulfillment. It's a message of expectation announced centuries earlier that this one will come. And Mark wants us to be aware that God has not forgotten his purposes, that he indeed remembers what his story is about and that he will indeed achieve his purposes. That's what Mark is saying. And so that reminds us of what we looked at last week, that we are to be ready, that we are to be awake. We saw last week in Mark 13 that Jesus uses a parable of the landlord going away and giving responsibilities to his stewards and saying, be ready, do your task, so that when I come back, things will be ready, things will be right. The challenge is, is that they are not to fall asleep, but to indeed do their task, be responsible, be ready, so that they can uh, receive the landlord coming back and that all is well. So the same idea is here. So it begins with a call to recognize that God's story will take place and we have to be ready to do it. In the verses that follow, Mark 1.15, when Jesus begins, this statement is used, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The time is fulfilled. The word time there is kairos. The, the kairos time is fulfilled. We've been waiting in the past. and The centuries go by, but now the kairos moment has come. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. So that is where Mark's going. So it's a call for us indeed to wait in expectation, and to be patient. And of course, that's a, that's a big challenge for us in our day. We are not a patient people. We like things to happen quickly. We want things to go in our timing. The biblical story is a story that we need to be patient about. So one writer says this, in a go-getting instant culture, we do well to cultivate the Christian quality of patience over against the constant pressure for success, results, and fulfillment. Patience. Patience comes from the word for suffering. There's an element of suffering in patience. We are called to suffer with whatever reality is as we wait for the good news to happen. We get so caught up in success and results and fulfillment that we, we're not very good at it. And so the writer is saying, encouraging us, will we wait in expectation? So it goes back to the past. That's where Mark begins. And then he launches into the story of his present, which is the story of John the Baptist. So the second point, Christ's work in the present, in his moment. So the writer says, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. So now it comes to Mark's day. 
What is he saying now? So John appears in the desert, and he comes preaching. Interesting, the Judean desert was and is a very wild place. It cascades down to the Dead Sea. You have all the salt formations. It really is a very wild place. And the desert is always seen in the Bible as a place of, of meeting God. It's a place of expectation and waiting. And so John, where does he appear? He appears in the wilderness, in the Judean wilderness, the same wilderness that Jesus is going to be driven by the Spirit into for 40 days. It's going to happen shortly. And so it's in the desert, in the wilderness, that John appears. Last week we talked about the need for us to create our own desert, our own place where we meet with God. It's, it's important that we're able to do that. Again, not to be so caught up that there is not a moment of, of waiting and of silence and of spending time with God. So John appears in the wilderness, in the desert, and he comes with a message of repentance. Repentance is simply a call to turn around, to change your mind, to alter your life. Repent, to turn. And so John is calling the people to turn. In the midst of your busyness, take time to turn and look to God and hear what he's saying, to hear his voice. That's where John goes. And as a sign of that, as a sign of saying yes, John baptizes the people in the River Jordan, even as Jesus will be baptized by John. And so baptism, then and now, is a, is a moment of crisis. It's a moment of choice. It's a moment where we say yes to God, where we say we have turned and are looking to him. And so the people come, and interesting, we're told that, that thousands come, a multitude come. For whatever reason, the people are really hearing John's word of come, hear something new from God. John was was actually recognized as the, as the first prophet in 400 years. So the people are very excited that a prophet has been raised up in their midst. And they go out, they leave the city of Jerusalem and go out into the wilderness to hear John and to indeed be baptized in the River Jordan. And so it's an action of repentance, an action of turning. Of course, in the Gospel stories, a great example is the person of Zacchaeus who's hiding in the tree and waiting for Jesus to come by, and Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I want to come to your house for lunch. And Zacchaeus, this very short man, comes down and takes him off to his house, and he's very excited, and, and in the midst of that, he repents. And he's a tax collector, and he says, if I've cheated anybody out of what you know, I owe them, I will give it back to them, and I will give them more in terms of making it right. He wants to make things right. It's a bold statement in the Gospels of someone repenting, a crisis moment. And so it's a time of preparation, a time for us in Advent to look to the Lord, both in the past, both in the present, Mark is saying. It's interesting when we use an Advent candle, the colors for Advent often are a rose color. And, and in that rose color, it's a, or a violet color, it's a, it's a uh, picture or a symbol of repentance, of turning. That's the idea. Prepare our hearts for what God is doing. So Mark begins by rooting his story in the Old Testament. He then tells the story of John, that he comes baptizing and preaching a word of repentance and turning to God. And then we see, indeed, that there is a future element to it, and this is where we end. Mark picks up again. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's where Mark is going, and he introduces this one who will come, the Messiah, Jesus, who will baptize with fire. So Mark is looking ahead because Jesus has not come yet. He's looking ahead to 
this Messiah who will come, the anointed one. So John dressed as a prophet, allusions back to the great prophet Elijah, who also spoke in the desert. Here he is, dressed in this kind of crazy way, and people recognize that this is, this is a different person. And they, are pa they take pause by his look, and they hear. And Jesus, John is saying, I baptize you with water, which he has done, but this one who is more powerful than I, who is stronger than I, will come and baptize with fire. And so there's this future element. So it's a word of promise, Mark is saying, because Jesus has not come, he's going to come. And in Advent, we recognize that Jesus still comes. He will come to you. He will come to me in this season of Advent. 2,000 years later, the Spirit of God in Christ comes to us. If we will take time to look and to hear and to listen, to allow the work of Christ in our lives. So it's a statement from the past to the present of Mark, to the future work of Christ who's going to come. And in verse 15, we hear his opening statement, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So that's where Mark begins. And so as we end, we ask, well, okay, what does that mean for us? What does this beginning round of Mark say to us about the incarnation? Well, I would say three points of application. First of all, incarnation is always about intimacy. The incarnation is God taking on flesh in Christ. And that is a movement towards us in closeness. God wants to be close with us. We've talked about God being our Abba. That Jesus always goes to God as Abba. And we are encouraged to use the same language in our relationship with him. And so in the midst of your crazy schedule, in the midst of all that's going on in your life, the incarnation is about, hey, God wants to be near you, close to you. That is the very purpose of the incarnation. That's why in the church cycle, four weeks, five weeks, every year, we give attention to this listening. God comes to us in closeness. That's what he wants. He's not a distant God. He comes. And so in the midst of our craziness, Will you take the time? Will I take the time to step away from distraction and, and create a little bit of, just a little bit of desert in your life? Five, six minutes a day where you actually quiet your heart and your mind so that you are listening to this God who comes close to us through his spirit in what is at the root of incarnation. God taking on flesh in Jesus Christ. For the very first time in the human story, God takes on flesh in Christ. He wants to be close. And secondly, of course, it's a message of purpose. It's a message that, that God wants to do something through us, that we also are forerunners of Christ. John the Baptist was a forerunner. Prepare the way of the Lord. But there's an aspect where we, we are all called to be prepare the way of the Lord, to be a forerunner, to be a witness of Christ both in word and in deed. As you embrace love and communicate love to others, that's what our lives are about. So it's not all about just success or will people know me or remember me or whatever else. It's, it's living in love, being a witness in word and deed. I believe that that, that that can go a long way in our lives to encourage us to recognize that we, in our own way, have a story to tell. And we weave our own threads into the great tapestry that God is weaving in Jesus Christ and we as his people, the church, called out ones. So second application is the message of purpose but thirdly, and I would say most importantly as we finish, it's a message of good news. It is a message of gospel. Mark talks about this is the gospel. Jesus comes, verse 15, announces the gospel. So that, that gospel word it was a fresh new word in it, and it meant good news. 
So the incarnation is about good news. It is about gospel. It is about Christ's word to you. Right now, 2020, pandemic, COVID-19, still God speaks a word of good news to you and to me, a word of gospel. That's where we are encouraged to hear. Hear those words. Good news, gospel. And so I love, I love the message of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17. And, he, and he, he's drawing back. It's, he's ending this epistle to the Thessalonians, this church in Thessalonica. And it's like he's saying, I want you to remember three things. This is how you're to live your life. You read those verses. One, be happy. As Christians, follower of Christ, be happy. His language is rejoice always. Simply it means be happy. Can you be happy? That's what Jesus is saying. That's what Paul's saying. Be happy. Secondly, be in conversation with me continually. That is, stay open-handed in your heart and your mind towards me. Pray continually. Be in conversation with me. Be mindful that I am the creator and I am in creation and I have come to you. Be in conversation. Be happy. Be in conversation with me. And then finally, he says, be thankful. Indeed, be thankful in all circumstances. Even in a new lockdown here in Toronto, you know, even CNN is talking about, hey, the biggest city of Canada is in lockdown. It's a big story. Even in the midst of lockdown, we can be thankful for all kinds of stuff in your life. To be thankful in all circumstances, Paul says. And so the message of incarnation, the message of Mark here for us is really that. You're invited to be happy. You're invited to pray, be in conversation with God, and indeed to be thankful. To hear that God comes to us in Christ. And I offer you these words this second Sunday of Advent. In Jesus' name, amen.
We come to a virtual table in the second week of Advent, and it carries special challenge and charm for us, I think. We've been gathering virtually at the Lord's table together since the middle of March. It's not and will never be normal, but we are as faithful as we can be to the practices that remind us of who we are. Last week, Tom and I were reminiscing about a Sunday in the summer of 2019 when we sat together after he told me he had stage four cancer. It was a communion Sunday, and when the cups were passed out, Tom leaned over and whispered, this is the best drink I ever had. In the poignancy of that moment, still digesting the news of his cancer, we laughed quietly like guilty kids. The laughter was not disrespectful of the meal, but rather in holy reverence of the gift of life and the gift of one another. This meal nourishes us in this life and prepares us for a life without end. The charm and challenge of Advent is the layering of experience and the practices of waiting. Children don't like to wait for presents and celebrations, and I suspect neither do we. But the responsibility of preparing for those events and those activities gives us composure and something to do, and it gives us the upper hand. But this Advent is different. We need the stories of Advent to ground us because the virtual table and the empty major are front and center in our experience. Emptied of the rush of Christmas, we are met with the silence of starlight and candles at the end of the day. And we also need the story of the Last Supper. As we gather around the virtual meal, it reminds us of a priceless forgiveness and second chances that we've been given by a loving father and his son. A meal that gives us courage to lay aside defenses that make us resistant to reconciliation. A meal that opens our eyes to our own transgressions. A meal whose ingredients are a love so strong and indescribable that it has overcome evil with good. No weapons, no exceptions, forever and always. This holy meal gives us bread for the journey, for a journey that may feel to some as if it's kind of uh, stalled out. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and these are the words that remind us of that Last Supper, as Paul retold it even in his time. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he gave thanks and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for a holy meal. Father, you knew our first breath before we took it. Nothing that happens in our lives is a surprise to you. Yet, we name the sins for our sake and not yours, silently. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this love which reaches through the mess and the tangles in our lives and in our time right now. We thank you for hands that find us, that do not give up, that come after us, that hold us, 
that heal us and that give us space to be together even when we can't be together. Because you say wherever two or more are gathered, and Father, we are gathered in the Spirit. Let us not forget who we are and whose we are, especially in this season as we consider the birth of your Son, the Word made flesh. We give thanks for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.